So I am here again. Uh, God help you for joining this. But I'm here again and I've got another guest. I've got Bob Harper from Agendly. Um, say hello, Bob. Hi. Um, believe it or not, Bob is an accountant. But you'll notice he has a personality and a matching top like me. <laughs> so, um, Bob, do you wanna do you wanna tell us a little bit about your background and what you're up to? And then we'll dig into some of the things that we've kind of already talked about and um, chew the fat on that might be helpful to people. Yeah, it's always, I say I'm a reformed accountant. <laughs> yeah, I, I, left, I left school uh, after A-levels, didn't go to university uh, because the people that I was studying A-levels with, I said, I can't spend another year or two or three or four with them. <laughs> so I missed out on university. I wish I knew because it, apparently it's all really good fun. So uh, I got a job in a bank. Uh, I was put, I wanted to be an investment advisor. Uh, and um, they said, look, go and work on the tax desk first because you need to understand the, the impact of tax. So that's how I started, really. You know, I fell into accountancy, really enjoyed tax, uh, intellectually challenging. You know, you can you can do some clever things. And uh, then I saw, you know, I think I was earning three and a half grand a year. So that gives me a little bit of my age away. And wow. I saw a job in London for eight and a half thousand. So I thought, well, I'll have a bit of that. And that was with a firm of chartered accountants. And so that, you know, that took me further into accountancy. And uh, yeah, there's been a bit of a journey. And the pivotal moment for me really was deciding to build my own bookkeeping software. There's a whole story around that. But I, I built that and used to give it away for free to clients. And that got me into the software industry, mm -hmm. which is agendally, you introduced me as a meeting management tool that we're launching in a, in a few weeks time. So whilst we're on the topic of of meetings which um i'm really curious when we were talking earlier you were talking about how the trajectories you know everybody knows that we waste a lot of time in meetings yeah mm -hmm. um because we we show up and then decide what we're going to talk about um but what are some of the things you've seen in terms of meetings and making them more effective and maybe maybe sales meetings i don't know what's your what's your take on sales meetings okay so you, well, first of all you're right you know that that uh you know getting together to have a meeting and then deciding what you're going to talk about is like a real classic one and i've been in those meetings and it's really painful um and and, I, and if you apply that to a sales meeting so as a general principle pre-work is a good thing pre-work mm -hmm. before a meeting so, I mean, as a, as a salesperson myself, um, I would, you know, do a pre-sales sort of routine, if you like, of checking out the prospect. Um, I could look at their social media, uh, see what's going on in their industry, download their accounts. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I can do before I go into a meeting. That and and that might allow me to ask standard questions, but in a in a in a better way. Mm -hmm. um, so asking somebody, um, you know, are you making enough profit? That's a pretty blunt question, but that's that that's one way of asking it. Asking a question like, I see you that you're in the hospitality business, and I was reading on the so and so website that you know profits have been suppressed in the last year because of this, that, and the other. Just curious, how are profits for you? That's a different type of question because I've done a bit of pre work. It had come across differently. Position me yeah. as an expert. Yeah, and and one's a bit more um, bridge building versus one that's a bit more confrontational. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, if uh, particularly if you're an accountant, um, which you're not anymore, but um, if you if you're an accountant trying to trying to engage a customer, you the cust the client wants to know that you understand them. Yeah. Because it's like, well, I don't. I mean, let's be honest, right? the accountancy world is very much black and white or black and red. Yeah. It's very much straight lines, but actually for the business owner, it's not. And maybe, maybe I'm being a bit, um, a bit naive in the way I'm talking about that. But, but what I'm getting at is the business owners looking and going, is this person the right person for me who understands my world and understands that I'm spinning all these plates and I've got to do all this stuff. Did they get me or are they just doing paperwork? Yeah. So 
Well, what that triggers me to say sort of back to you is that you, you are right. Uh, the, well, I, was, I would explain it. The accountancy culture uh, is about jobs. So mm -hmm. they're, they're fixated by, you know, the dates that they're, they're think, thinking about are the submission dates. You've got to get your accounts in by this date. You've got to get your tax return in that. And, they're, they're, you know, and they have been in the past and many still are paid for doing a job. Mm -hmm. They're not paid for having a relationship or mm -hmm. giving advice that delivers results to to a yeah. business. You know, it's uh, it, it's changing. Um, but when I, you know, I am still an accountant. I've still got a handful of clients. So my my approach to accounting is person first. Um, I've got a label called life centered accountant, with a few other accountants sort of do with me. So before I ask business questions, I would always, you know, I want to know the person. I want to know why they're in business, what they did before business. They've been in business for five years. You must have learned a lot. You know, what are some wins? What are some lessons that you've learned? Um, what, when are you looking to get out of business? What do you like about business? What do you dislike about business? So that allows me to ha to build a relationship because I understand them. Th then I want to, you know, they, say, oh, I they give me permission then to ask questions about the business. Mm -hmm. And if I can demonstrate that I understand them, I understand their sector, and I understand their business, Yes, I know the accounts and tax. Then you know you've got something of foundation to build off. And I think, you know, I've seen this that the perception it's changing, but the perception of accountant is they do the paperwork at certain times of the year, like you said about the job. But actually, that expertise, if it can be, and I'm not, I don't. Hopefully, you don't take offence at this. It operationally commercialized. Yeah. So you've got somebody with a lot of expertise in, in finance, in looking at how a business is in, what shape a business is in from the raw numbers. If an accountant can kind of like translate that into guidance for the business that that's beyond, Oh, you need to cut costs or, um, your profitability ratio should be this actually engaging almost like a partner with the business and saying, you know, how can we get your margins up? Where's the places where you can, it looks like there's too much fat here that you could be cutting. I think there's a lot of value in that, that people might pay for. You're dead right. I mean, I, I work with one firm map, and they are they refer to themselves as finance partners not accountants mm -hmm. and that's where i believe the profession is moving and you know and will deliver a lot more value to society um because you are partnering with a with your client um and you're taking them on a journey uh you know numbers and money is the language of business at the end of the day yeah um and many business owners don't speak that language very well to, to, to help somebody get insight and better understanding of their business um, and to, you know, deconstruct it into drivers and focus on drivers, one of which is pricing and, you know, one might be acquisition of customers and retention. You know, everything can be broken down to a number. And once you've got a number, you can manage it and you can test it and you can refine it and you can improve it. And those little changes, you know, just like the Sky um, cyclist team, you know, the 1% improvement over a consistent period of time on lots of little things makes mm -hmm. a big difference. Yeah. And, and I was, to, you know, in my world, we talk about, well, hang on a minute. If your, if your success at getting new customers just improves a little bit, then over the year that compounds and you can actually grow by quite a lot by just focusing on improving you know, I'll give you an example. I'm not against cold outreach. Yeah, I know I preach against it, but I preach against it because of how much damage it does. In that if you fire out 200 emails, some people are going to go, go away, don't talk to me ever again. And actually more people say, go away, don't talk to me ever again. Then people come back and say, oh, I'm interested. <laughs> but what, I, what I'm trying to encourage people to do is think about, well, and it's same for like business and accountants is, if you can improve the success rate of your outreach and your selling activity, even by a margin, it makes a huge difference. Rather than going volume, uh, do you know, increase the output, shout louder, do more, 
how can we keep doing what we're doing but actually make it more effective and then the accountant's version is well um get more customers um charge more to existing customers and save money you actually make a lot of money yeah yeah it's breaking it's breaking the business model down in into those drivers that's the phrase that i use and looking at the customer journey um and and trying to improve each step um so you know the number of people that hit the website the number of people that register the number of people that book a meeting the number of people that have a follow-up meeting the number of people that have a uh, a proposal the proposal to close you know and and it, all those little steps if you improve them all um you, you over many years it has a massive impact mm -hmm. and and it, and what the accountants are good with numbers and measuring and putting those systems into place and holding account, uh, their clients accountable and keeping them focused as many mm -hmm. business owners want to go off on the next shiny thing without just improving the, the things that they're already doing yeah so so when you when you came up with agendally yeah um and you know there's a the, there's a statement on your linkedin profile um, and it says here are eight meeting mistakes which cost you 441 billion a year every year or cost 441 441 billion every year um we agree on probably the first few no no agreed agenda in other words nobody knows why they're coming other than a, a you know a headline reason so nobody's prepared which is your second point and then starting late and overrun that's always the case because you didn't prepare. So you, you, I, I've been in meetings where you get there and then you're figuring out the data points to actually make a decision. And then you actually, the meeting becomes an education piece, not, and no decisions are made. Yeah. Um, and the focus points, um, these are all good. And we know that meetings have to take place and we know that this shouldn't happen. But why do we keep letting it happen? That's a good question. I I think I think our, us as humans, you know, we're not built for discipline. Well, I'm certainly not. I mean, I'm I'm on the track of losing a bit of weight at the moment and running. And, you know, last week I didn't do a run. This week I'm really playing. You know, I pat myself on the back. I've done two already, and so I will do my three or four runs this week. Most people that do, uh, you know, January resolutions and they've 90 percent have gone by the 6th of february or something aren't they mm -hmm. so so it, it's easier to have a bad meeting than it is a good meeting mm -hmm. you know it, it's it's easier to do bad things than good things so having a good meeting requires energy you know and commitment and and focus and it's easier i'll oh, just show up and have a chat and but you know that's the cost there is a cost of doing that and so if we put that our accountancy world together again you know accountants will be meeting with potential clients a lot yeah that's the, mm -hmm. the done thing isn't it you meet the accountant you get the look of them you get the vibe of them how can an accountant because they're not natural salespeople they've been trained to look at numbers data and you know facts stats figures it's very analytical but actually the sales process is very emotional um and you seem to have crossed that bridge from the the, you know, the logical side of accountancy to the emotional side of the sales piece as well. Well, that's my perception. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are some of the things you'd be saying to accountants if they're if they're meeting with new clients? What are some of the things that they should be doing in those meetings to actually show their value and and draw that client to say this person gets me? So there's three stage, three um, phases. There's the pre-meeting, there's the meeting, and then there's the follow-up. So first of all, sometimes it's about not meeting people, you know, disqualifying okay. people. Yeah. So that you meet with the right people, and that comes into your world of marketing and making sure you're engaging with the right people in the right place. Otherwise, you end up meeting people you shouldn't be meeting, and then then you doubt yourself. You think, "Well, I'm at a meeting, and there's not a lot of value there." You're talking to the wrong person. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you shouldn't spoke. So, making sure you meet the right people, making sure that you are prepped and they are prepped before the meeting, so you can start the meeting at, at a decent level. Because mm -hmm. um, you you know you might only have an hour or ninety minutes with somebody, so you you want to start 
as high up the value curve as possible and pre-work will help you do that and doing so research. Let me just let me just when you say start high up the value curve hmm. right we have to get in the client's head for that value curve don't we yes yeah well the reason i say that is often and we were talking about this with symptoms and consequences and 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 uh, all of that is very often we approach a prospect with one frame of thinking but actually the prospects approaching it with a completely different way of thinking in in that you know what what's valuable to the client versus what's value what we think is valuable yeah how would you help how would you advise accountants to think from the business owner's world instead of their perspective well that, that's that's a mindset and and i think what you got to do is put down what you want out of the meeting put down your solutions your tax planning your business advisory your your cash flow forecasting tools you've got to leave that um, sort of in the bag if you like you know i, I remember doing a, a session with somebody and said just pretend you've got a briefcase with all your stuff in put it on the floor lock it and forget about it right and focus on the client mm -hmm. you know focus on the client and and listen and don't assume anything I'd be curious to the point of potentially being annoying but you know you you won't annoy someone usually if you're asking good questions about them because they love talking about themselves mm -hmm. um, and they love talking about their business that they created Mm -hmm. um and sharing their wins and admitting to their challenges that they've overcome mm -hmm. uh so that's that's it's, that it's a mindset thing really it's a bit like though when you said about the briefcase on the floor i think that's a point for everybody really because that's almost like feature selling yeah, yeah people try and feature sell and i use the example with people of let's say let's say i'm a holiday resort yeah so I've got a holiday resort, lovely, beautiful place, South Beach, Miami. The sun's there, the sand. Um, you know, it's it's amazing place. And I lead with the plane ticket. Yeah, do you like this ticket? It's made of quality paper, and actually, it's 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 one hundred percent recyclable. And and it's like no no no, the tax planning, the thing that you're actually selling is Miami. Yeah, you're not selling the plane ticket. But yet, not just accountants. Many people do that. They they focus on the box, not what the box gets people. And I, and I understand that. And and I and I can fall into that trap because you know we develop our brands, we develop our products, our services, our solutions. We're proud of them. Um, we get testimonials on them and case studies, and uh, and it's easy to fall into the trap that that's what we're selling. But uh, that's not what's being bought. <laughs> and if if you focus on what's being bought and not and not what's being sold, um, and and I, like I said, I think that's a a mindset. You need, need a perspective. You just need to. Um, I I think you have the same questions. You know, you can have uh, you can create your questions, and um, but the answers will be different for different people. So when you were talking about the analogy there, I was thinking about the. Um, I'm based down in Cornwall. People surf down here, and people buy wetsuits. Yeah, but people buy the same wetsuit for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Some people will buy that wetsuit because it allows them to move on the board, you know, more more freely because they're really top class surfers. Other people will buy exactly the same thing, but to look good when they walk on the beach. Mm -hmm. So you won't know what why they're buying it unless you ask questions and yeah. if you're pitching it because this will make you look good on the beach but you're a pro surfer you won't buy it because you've pitched it wrong same product but people buy for a different motivation yeah and that's the only way you get that is by actually asking the right questions in that meeting yeah so tell me um i don't want to run too far over but you shared on your linkedin and maybe you can give us an an overview of this is how one meeting that you did let me get this right that one meeting yielded like a huge ton of money one way to do a meeting let me get this right one you it was an article you put up and you helped one client change their meeting structure 
and it just transformed their business, right? Yeah. So Pete, Pete, who's the business owner, has got no problem me telling this this story and sharing the information. I've written an article and he, he checked it uh, before I published it. So um, it's a fish and chip shop business, very big, successful fish and chip shop business. He'd been running for about 17 years when I first first met him, and he he came to me uh, with a with a with a frustration, uh, which was um, he, he wanted the business to make more profit, and he wanted the business to be a more self managing business, so it didn't consume him, didn't take all all of his time. And he shared a few books with me, Profit First and Traction, which you or some other you know your listeners might might be aware of. I I didn't know of Traction at the time, and it, uh, he was recommended to me by, by another accountant. And he said, could you help me implement it? And I said, well, I, I don't really know, but let me have a look at the book. It was Christmas time. I said, I'll read it over Christmas and we're chatting the new year. I read it over Christmas and it answered a lot of questions I had uh, about some products that I was building, including Agendaly. And it also answered some questions that I didn't have. So it really, you know, really filled in some gaps. And one of the things it exposed me to was this thing called the Level 10 meeting. So anyway, long story short, I said, yeah, let's give it a go. I won't charge him a full whack. I've never done this before. Let's just see how we get on. And uh, it it went really well. And and it, it, he had his worst year in 17 years financially. And within like nine months, it was going great. He, you know, it's not all down to this agenda. There's other things as well. But and the agenda was a key driver in, in transforming those business results because it shook out the issues that needed to be shook out and it, it it shined a light on them and they didn't go away until they were resolved. So it was the discipline of running that meeting and that, and that agenda, which comes from the book traction mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, and me moving from an accountant to like, um, into business advice, that one agenda, which is the only tool that I used really, um, I generated 20,000 pounds worth of, of revenue for myself in doing that, uh, which, which was cheap for the result that was that was delivered you know and it, it was a financial benefit and a non-financial benefit the business made more money and pete got more time and less stress in his so, life so looking at that level 10 um agenda and you i i spotted you're trying to include this into agenda lee yeah what's what's the objective or the what's the uh, the miami destination that you want to achieve with agenda lee for the people who use it they end not, up not the plane ticket yeah yeah Miami. well they, they end they end up with, with the life that they want the business is an enabler to give mm -hmm. somebody the life that they want mm -hmm. you know business generates revenue and capital growth like an investment you just happen to work in it you put money in and time and energy and and, and it should give you something back and what it gives you back is the life that you want to live Mm -hmm. um, and meetings help you drive that business forward. So that's what the level of the level 10 agenda can do and meetings can do. Um, it's not really about saving time, having quicker meetings or having better meetings. It's about getting the life that you truly want, mm -hmm. the holidays that you want, the helping the kids on the housing ladder, being out of business, enjoying your holiday home, whatever it is that floats your boat. Um, the business I, I believe businesses has unlimited potential. It's the asset that you're most in control about. You can learn how to be successful in business and you can do it and you can keep doing it. Even if you fail, you can go again. Mm -hmm. So I think the business is an, an amazing thing that can transform lives, yours, your families, your mm -hmm. customers. So um, yeah, that you, you end up with what you want, a happy life. But only if you use the right drivers to get there yeah yeah you, i mean there's a lot that needs to align you need a profitable business model you need a strategy that to take that model to market you need a team mm -hmm. and you know within that you need the right pricing the right products the right marketing the right sales the right operations so there's a lot that needs to line up for a business mm -hmm. to be successful but everything's out there you know, there's so many books, there's probably too many, but all the information's out there on how to be successful. It's pretty much decoded. Um, you just got to learn and then execute. So so what's the plan? When are you planning to launch Agenda? It's really soon, isn't it? Yeah, six months ago. 
it's it's late it's late we've had some issues um but we, we i did some testing at the end of last week it's looking good um but unfortunately with software if anyone's ever been involved you fix one thing and two things break so i i think we're we're a few weeks away and possibly the end of april at the latest with a bit of luck okay so so if if accountants are watching this in all our modern technology um I shouldn't do that really because uh, my accountant's actually a hip a, a hipster with a beard but oh. um what do you see as the changes that are coming because of social media the way we're working now for accountants because a lot of accountants rely on referrals a lot of accountants rely on they've been around for a long time to pick up business how do you see that client acquisition changing for for professional services actually to be honest with you yeah well there's i mean i was around before the internet i can remember a client saying to me if you don't get email i can't stay with you you know and he was a tech guy um so uh and in those times it was you know put a yellow pages advert out and maybe an advert in your local paper life was a lot simpler certainly from a marketing point of view um although the principles are the same mm -hmm. um it's now there's more channels you know and there's more tech and there's more things to do there's more distraction um i th i think it's more uh i think it's more now about communities and giving value mm -hmm. and like social media you know you can hit more people um you can get you can massive exposure today compared to before for next to nothing so yeah. i mean with with agendaly for example um i i will be pumping out hopefully what people will perceive as really fantastic valuable information for free mm -hmm. and i can do that at no cost i can get the whole planet engaged if i've got the right message mm -hmm. to the right audience and you could never do that before so um you got you, you I think it's more values based. Um, I say engaging with communities, giving more. And I think in the old days, certainly in accountancy, I, I, I think there's almost like a power shift. Whereas the accountant, you know, you go to the accountant, can you be my accountant, please? You know, I've heard good things about you. Whereas now accountants are going, can you be my client, please? Yeah, which is um, which is an unusual thing. But I mean, you're on LinkedIn. You've got four thousand two hundred and something people you're engaged with that's you know you would have to pay a small fortune for that in the old world for, yeah. for that ability to just go i'm going to put a message out there now you can't just say hey buy my stuff and that's where you say you've got to add value so that people see that it's worthwhile having bob in their world yeah and and it's, it's in although i've got four thousand i'm I'm not sure that's a good number. Maybe I should have forty thousand. But um, the uh, what I do get engagement through LinkedIn, and if I do a poll, quite a few people uh, engage. So I know I'm on the radar. I think the key influences in, in our in in the accountancy world know about me, mm -hmm. even if my prospects don't. And I'm sure because most accountants aren't on link on on LinkedIn. If they are, they're not active on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You know, too busy doing accounts and tax returns, but the key influencers are. So through that, I think I've got like a speaking gig, for example, on the 11th, you know, we, we 11th of May, a, a big accountancy exhibition. So and that's great. I mean, you can't pay for to do that. You can't pay and go, I want to do a speaking gig. You've sort of got to be invited. So, yeah, I think it's good for your positioning and, and your and your uh, professional network. It's interesting, though, isn't it? that um, A lot of accountants aren't. But one of the most active pe pe groups of people, we did a study for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in during um, it was part of a funded program they were running. And they we commissioned we were commissioned to analyze what was going on on LinkedIn. So we did this study analyzing industries, different roles to see what's going on in the pandemic. And the most active group on the platform were business owners. Mm. And the least active group on LinkedIn is actually accountants and lawyers. That's amazing, isn't it? And it's like, like there, there's like a room full of all the people you want to do business with and you don't go, you're not there. Yeah. The, the, the trouble is that accountants, the business model they operate is a brilliant business model because 
the demand is generated by government you have to almost have an accountant right unless you're going to learn how to do accounts and tax which is a crazy thing to do to do it once a year your the demand is is legal you have to buy this service from a narrow you know restricted sort of supply because you've got to get qualified and, and do, not everyone can be an accountant well you can but you know it's not the case uh, you have to really be qualified to, to do it um, and you have to buy it every year for, forever so um, that's why a lot of accountants are very busy and they're probably not active on LinkedIn and you know their marketing isn't as good as it could be because they don't need it to be I mean well, I, it, like, the, it, like the fish and chip shop guy I was telling you about it's not law that you have to go and have fish and chips every Friday. He's got to work for that. But I suppose as 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 the world moves on, you're going to get more kind of entrepreneurial accountants, shall we say, or people coming into this space where they go, you know what, we can make this better for people. And they will have, if if they master the marketing piece, they will have the advantage. I mean, look at where zero just absolutely nailed their marketing when they came to market. They absolutely just hammered it. I'm just looking up now, uh, just to double check that what I'm going to say is right. I think it is. Um, so you know, zero came from sage dominating to zero, like going, let's make this really easy. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm I'm a I'm an outsider in this sense, but I remember Sage being like top of the tree. And then suddenly this zero thing comes along and it's like, whoosh. yeah. And there yeah. are industries like that, that are kind of like waiting for somebody to take the marketing space and innovate. Well, it's happening in the States and it's starting to happen here. So this, uh, the, what the thing I was just looking up was just to double check the name. And I, it, it's pilot. So there's a, there's a, there's a brand, uh, firm in the US called Pilot. Jeff Bezos has, has invested. I think right. it's a 1.4 billion valuation accounting firm. Something like it's crazy money. But you know they've only they've not been going very long, and they are better at marketing accountancy services than accountants. So <laughs> they're going to win. They're going to be the same at delivering it. You know they mm -hmm. might not they might not be better. They don't need to be better to win. They just need mm -hmm. to be as good at delivering it, but better at marketing. And yeah. you know that 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 there's a huge amount of VC money going into the accounting sector because yeah, they because know it's it's ripe for disruption. Uh, and it and it it performs year on year because of it's mandated. Yeah. Which is yeah. fascinating. Well, it's fascinating to see what will happen because I, I don't know, but if you think about it, every if you think about Uber. All Uber did was put themselves in between drivers and the consumers and put technology in the way to make it easier for the consumers. Yeah. The accountancy world could, I'm not saying an Uber, but it's not inconceivable that you could have a business model that is created that puts the accountants at, at a distance from the, con the customer. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what that is, of course. Yeah, but... I mean, Intuit and QuickBooks in, in the States are offering bookkeeping and I think now tax services. And things are being blended. And I don't know if you've noticed this, look, um, there are new banks, the challenger banks that are popping up. An example is counting up. It's a bank. But as you as the transactions hit the bank account, it does the bookkeeping for you and sends you making tax digital return. So you're blending accounting and uh, well, fintech and banking is being blended. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that uh, that I think is happening in 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 many sectors. And for accountants, blending tech, fintech and services, there's people like Crunch in the UK are doing it, and a few others. I can't remember their names now, but that's the challenge for the traditional accountant. And with COVID, that's accelerated all the all the sort of trends that were happening. So people are now happy to have a conversation like we are, you know, in Zoom or or Google Meet or what have you. So that means you're not restricted anymore to dealing with clients in your local area. You can work anywhere. And people are more comfortable buying professional services online. They have to. So once that that's now been broken, that habit's broken, it can never go back. People are never going to go, I want a local, you know, 50 years time, I want to go to a, an office and drive. I have to pay for parking, walk, go into an office, drive a meeting about my accounts. Just not going to happen. And even down to, I talk to some of my clients on, on chat. Yeah. 
you know, I'll just be, and it's like, that's quite an adjustment to the way you work. Yeah. It's brilliant. It's it's great for everybody, isn't it? Because you, 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 delivering the service, you can be anywhere, consuming it, you can be anywhere. Um, and you've got more reach, you've got more choice on who you work with. So you don't have to work with people that you don't really get, get on with. Yeah. That the you know, as long as you don't, and <laughs> if you can, if you can polarize, in other words, if you can build your own tribe, I think, I think that's pretty healthy. Um, but the days of, oh, I've got to appeal to everybody or vanilla and just aren't kind of there anymore. Because well, my, no, I, I agree. My, my business advice is like the pricing strategy. There's broadly three price points, expensive, average, and cheap. As a small business, you cannot afford to be cheap because you haven't got the money to scale to volume. So you ignore being cheap. Even if you start to business today, you cannot be cheap. It just won't work. And if you are cheap on day one and you try to change your prices later, you'll lose all your clients. So mm -hmm. it leaves two, average and high. If your average price, just a little bit below average, on average, or a little bit higher than average, you're the same as everybody else. And, you know, you're not going to be able to stand out. Your price mm -hmm. says more about you than your website. Yeah. So you've got only one choice it's to be expensive as a small business. And that means niche. That means yeah. being niche and serving a certain type of customer in a certain way and not worrying about all the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, vanilla doesn't sell these days. Actually, I have a, a, a I say a friend, uh, I've not probably seen him in five years. He he wrote a book called The Rage, Rage Against Beige. <laughs> and he sold it for about 50 grand to Ikea. He sold the book rights and they published this book, The Rage Against Beige. Um, and it's true. Actually, a lot of professional services are very middle of the road, very similar, very all the same. And if you don't stand out, if you don't create that uniqueness, people won't warm to it. And then when you're faced with, is it that one or that one? You know, and I did, an, I don't know whether you saw it. I did a video about this the other day and I said, what happens if you're offering about the same price and about the same service? How do people choose? And it's like, mm. actually, it comes down to the very human elements of which one did I like yeah. and which one gives me the most confidence. Yeah. And the, the, the I mean, one of, one of the things I, I studied, as I mentioned, I'm not sure before or after you've hit the record, was I, I read a lot about business not just about accounts and tax i learned accounts and tax from books and i started to learn from business and one of the books is positioning for the battle for the mind and i don't know if you come across this one but the brain can only store typically seven things on one category unless you're really really interested in on something then you'll store a load of other stuff so like an accountant um if you if you well, where i was from reading there might be 50 or 100 accountants in reading that's quite difficult to sort of stand out if you're an accountant. So what I did is I created the concept of the alternative accountant. Mm -hmm. Now that means I'm the, the prospects now got a choice, 39 or 50 or whatever it is, other accountants or one alternative accountant. And the, the idea of positioning is to open the mind. So people go, well, what's an alternative accountant? They have to know. Mm -hmm. That's the brain has to know because it can't make Very a decision awesome. without knowing. Yeah. So yeah, positioning is absolutely key and that's tied in with your price. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, Rolls Royce sell cars. Yeah. Apple sell phones. And actually Apple are the most expensive phones and the biggest individual seller of phones. So this, the, it, in some senses, the, volume the supply and demand based on price doesn't always pan out because apple created their own market so yeah. um i don't know whether you've read it the 22 universal laws of branding I, I think that's the same author as positioning yeah so so um the brilliant bit in it is the law of category mm -hmm. yeah where it basically says um coke and pepsi are into their fates are actually intertwined with each other that having a rival 
actually helped grow the awareness of the other two and also said well create your own category if it's yeah. saturated create your own category so in other words they made the coke market yeah which is a, a market in and of itself separate to the fizzy drinks and the soft drinks market that actually accountants legal people can actually create their own category yeah and, yeah that's the that's the word i should have used with the alternative accountant we yeah. we are the only alternative accountant we are number one because we created yeah. that category um so yeah i i very much believe in from a branding point of view is create the category promote the category um and then once that space is created you can climb to the top of the ladder because mm -hmm. it's your ladder yeah absolutely so we're looking forward to agendally coming out bob you're you're linked in through and through right so if people want to find out more about what agendally can do they want to ask you questions about how this uh level 10 meeting structure helped they can reach out to you yeah yeah no problem um and linkedin's your domain um any last final thoughts if there's anybody listening to this about mm, i want to grow my business i want to i want to i want to get that life that you talk about what would be two little tips you'd probably leave them to think about be careful what you wish for really really challenge yourself because we're all um i think slightly brainwashed by the society that we live in you know and we've got expectations on us so really you know take some time out to really really think about your values and what's important to you before you start building a business plan because why why there's nothing wrong in having a small business mm -hmm. you don't have to grow the business maybe you should have less clients maybe you should have less profit maybe you should totally change your life so really have some you know some soul searching on that one because once you commit to a goal then you sort of the the you know the dice are rolling if you know what i mean and then you might have to raise money you might have to take risks you might have to hire people you don't want to hire you might have to take clients on you don't want to take on and take work on you don't enjoy doing so really think carefully about um about what you want uh and then once you've got that clear commit to having this weekly meeting if that's part of the strategy execution um there's no point having a plan in, unless you've got a, a plan to, to to make the plan a reality so have your weekly meeting where you look at the progress and the performance of the business and discuss the issues that are holding you back so you can solve those issues rather than go year after year after year of never getting anywhere and never really knowing why so just to just to avoid the trap of being too busy to think about what you're doing okay awesome that's really good bob thank you so much for joining me thank you for putting up with my unscripted questions cool. um and if as i said um go check out agendaly um the domain and website is it's agenda with li.com and at um, the moment at the moment we're looking for accountants to to come into the beta uh, probably you know end of april beginning of may um we've got a waiting list of about 120 firms so we're looking forward to uh hearing what they say about it cool and check out bob uh, bob harper on linkedin as well and bob thanks again for coming on